Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. This is Richard Gearhart. And Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. At Passage to Profit, we're all about the creativity, energy, and excitement that comes from starting your own business. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Tonight we have as our guest Lorenzo Buffa. Lorenzo is the CEO, founder, and lead designer at Analog Watch Company. He's a motivated entrepreneur, product designer, and educator with an interest in market differentiation through product marketing and material innovation. So welcome, Lorenzo. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about Analog Watch. I'm the designer and founder of Analog Watch Company, and we are a Philadelphia-based design studio focused on crafting innovative and modern timepieces out of natural materials. So we use materials such as marble, moss, wood, cork, and recently we've even used wine. How do you use wine to design a watch? So we have a collection called the Psalm Collection, and the bands are made with natural cork, and they are dyed with red or blueberry wine. Sounds like my kind of watch. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you use this for your watch or do you eat it? I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it makes five o'clock come a little bit faster. <laughs> so Analog started about five years ago, and it was the result of a thesis design project. I developed a line of wooden watches. A year and a half after graduating from undergrad, um, I decided to bring the product to market, and I launched it on Kickstarter. I raised $75,000, and a few months later, we got our first wholesale account, which was the Museum of Modern Art. Since then, we've begun to continue selling to other museums, Guggenheim, Smithsonian, MoMA, partnered with other major brands like Maker's Mark, uh, Mercedes-Benz, and we've continued to try to cement ourselves as a differentiator within the category because we really are the only people who are making timepieces out of natural materials in totally innovative ways. And you have jewelry as well. We do. We have some small accessories now, bangles and rings that are uh, mostly done with florals and resin, but there's actual real flowers in the products. Going back, so your first account was MoMA, is that right? Absolutely. Wow. Designers work their whole life to get to that point, to have something associated with that museum. That's fantastic. You, you are absolutely right. And when the opportunity presented itself, I mean, it kind of became a mad dash to do everything we could to appease the scenario. When the watch was being designed, MoMA Shopper was the target customer. There's no logo on the face. It's the only wood watch on the market with a soft, flexible wooden band. That came out of the, you know, the focus on designing through the lens of differentiation, right? So everybody else was doing wooden links, and we decided to, you know, at the time it was just me, decided to try to develop this soft, flexible wooden band. Uh, with MoMA shoppers as the ultimate sort of end demographic, MoMA reached out to us, and I had 48 hours. I had a weekend to pull together my first wholesale catalog. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I called in friends. I went and bought a bunch of clothes. We did hair and makeup. We did a whole video shoot, and we created a custom catalog and package for them. And then ultimately, we got into the store, and we were selling that watch for about a year and a half. And you didn't sleep during that weekend, <laughs> those two days. I don't even think I wanted to. Yeah. So how did they find you? Kickstarter, the online crowdsourcing platform, was celebrating five years, and they had done a Kickstarter meets MoMA partnership. So MoMA was going to introduce about 15 Kickstarter projects in their stores for a couple months. And so we were a part of that MoMA Kickstarter program. Ultimately, the watch itself ended up being one of the best sellers, so they kept it on for a year and a half. What did you do to actually get started on Kickstarter? You know, it's a multifold strategy, right? So, you know, you spend a couple months preparing your content, making sure you have the products right. But you also research your competition. So I knew what sort of price point would work out the best. I had an idea of what sort of language would sort of provoke people to want to purchase the product, mentioning that's a great gift item. Um, and then really spending a number of months building up your champions. So building your email list, networking and communicating with everybody you knew so that the day you launch, you already have a pool of champions to jump on board. And it's worked for us. We've done five campaigns now, um, raising over a quarter million dollars in the last five years on Kickstarter alone. That does seem to be sort of the standard Kickstarter model, right? Is that you really only almost have to have your market before you launch because what you want is that big initial impact. And that gets everybody excited about your product. It gets a lot of attention for it. And that's how you generate the interest to... Uh, yeah, it's definitely a snowball effect. Um, the platform's changed a lot. I mean, you know, each consecutive campaign we do, it's definitely a different strategy and a bit more of a struggle. But, you know, it's the internet. It changes constantly, and you just kind of have to keep abreast to it. So how did you get the idea to 
take these natural materials and put them into watches. It was a thesis project, and I just wanted to get a job, right? I had an interest in woodworking, and I honed in on a niche, which was the wooden accessory market. And then I found a really small market at the time, which was wood watches. And I saw that everybody was doing the links. And I said, there's another way you can do this. There's ways you can bend wood veneer. And maybe there's a way we could create this soft and flexible band, this really supple band. So it started by wanting to use wood and then trying to differentiate. And even at launch, right, for our first year, we were pretty much people referring to us as a wood watch company. But at that point, I knew to correct people you know, as much as I could because I knew that we were going to be working on stuff that involved other natural materials. You know, I wanted to push marble. I wanted to push flowers and plants. And so the idea sort of rose out of a love for nature itself, a passion for the material. There's kind of a higher level sculptural component to it. You know, we, we like to think that we're creating a little reminder of nature on someone's wrist every single day. And in today's kind of chaotic world, I think there's a bit more of a demand for it. Is making a product out of wood different than making it out of metal? I mean, obviously, there's some going to be some overlap in terms of the techniques, but are there special processes that you need to learn about in order to make the watches? A hundred percent. The one thing that still keeps me up at night is the manufacturing. When you're, you know, water jetting, you know, using a water jet to cut marble at incredibly thin scale and, and expect that piece to last for a couple of years on somebody, or if you're using wood and it hasn't been properly stabilized, you know, the biggest challenge for me has always been dealing with the production and making sure that the product itself lived up to the customer expectations. I looked at your website. Can you just say the name of your website right now? So it's analogwatchco.com. It's analogwatchco.com. So I went on your website and you have an amazing array of beautiful, beautiful products on there. And I'm just wondering how many watch different watch styles do you have now? We have five collections and each collection has between four and eight styles. So because you can add different colored bands. So effectively, some collections, we kind of have like 16 or 20 sort of variants. It's a bit of a kit of parts, right? If you like the white marble face with the blue band, you can get that combination. Did you design all of these yourself then? Yeah, 100% of the design has been done in-house. And then I work with a huge slew of uh, manufacturing partners all over the world. I have to say, when I was on the website, I could not resist (laughs) buying a watch. But it was luckily (laughs) Richard's birthday. The first day I wore the watch, I was at a clothing store. And one of the managers there looked at it and said, wow, what a fantastic looking watch. So I was sold on it the very first day I wore it. We're airing this show with people with consumer products because Christmas is coming up. And these make great gifts, and I don't have one yet. Wink, <laughs> wink, nudge, nudge. Is that directed at me? <laughs> it certainly is. I love my watch. It's like a piece of jewelry, right? Yeah, and you know, a, a watch is more than just a functional object. You know, in a big capacity, it's a statement of who you are and what you might believe in, right? So if you're wearing a, a wooden analog watch, it might say something about you. It might indicate you're stylish. It might indicate that you care about the environment. That you want an eco-oriented product. Timepieces are really having a resurgence right now, and it's a, it's a great space to be in because you can sort of push the limits because more than ever, a timepiece is now functioning as jewelry, a wearable work of art. So after you got MoMA, how did you get these other museums? Ultimately, right, when you have um, a major name like MoMA on board, you can sort of use that as a catapult to acquire these other accounts. I mean, we did all the standards. We participated in major industry trade shows which are very expensive, time-consuming, you know, a lot of cost in terms of print, labor, setup. But we pretty much played the cards right. We, you know, we mentioned BOMA whenever we could, and then all of a sudden we got Guggenheim, and then all of a sudden we got National Gallery of Art. And, you know, in between all those accounts, we had Urban Outfitters and other small retailers all over the United States and different parts of the world. Um, in fact, Japan is our second biggest market. They really are interested in craving unique accessories, and our aesthetic really speaks to that culture. That was one thing I was going to say, is that you did a great marketing campaign, you did a great Kickstarter campaign, but I think you really got a lot of traction, too, because these are so unusual. And if you're looking for the gift for somebody that has everything, you don't know what to get them. You can get on this. Like I like the ones with the marble around the watch face. And what are the bands on those? Can you use any band? So the model you're discussing is our solid marble bodied watch, I think. And it's the world's first watch made out of a solid piece of marble. And those come with a leather nubuck band that are made in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. What colors marble do you have for those? Uh, we do white and black. Well, that's great. So we're coming to the end of our segment here, and we'll be right back with Lorenzo Buffa. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR, the voice of New York. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start 
start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Tonight, we'll have three entrepreneurs pitch their companies. After the pitches, you, our listeners, can go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com and vote for your favorite pitch. That's GearHeartLaw, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can vote for a week. Well, your followers can vote for a week. But everybody only gets to vote once. So you really need to reach out to your social media networks, whomever you know, and get them to come and vote. And just remember the name of the show by imagining you're walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end. Passage to Profit. And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. And listeners, if you want to be on the show, come to a Passage to Profit meetup in New York. Just go to Meetup and Google it and pitch your idea to us. So you can go to the Meetup website or just Google Passage to Profit show and you'll find it and you can sign up. It's that simple. It's free to be on the show. All we ask is that you have a website and that you promote the show on your social media. Tonight we have as our guest Lorenzo Buffa. Lorenzo, let's continue now with your story. As I learned before the show, you have a patent. You wrote the patent yourself, the provisional patent yourself. So tell us a little bit about that and what it covers and why you filed the patent. So if we bring it back to the wood watch, which was the original concept, I had developed this soft, flexible wooden watch band. And once my business sort of, you know, was up and running, I had some capital and I decided to go ahead and try to develop a patent. Now, for me, a design patent was really not worthwhile because in some capacity, I think a design patent is only as valuable as you can afford to sue or litigate. (laughs) Right. And I mean, design patents cover the ornamental features of the product. And so your plan was to have lots of different watches, right, with lots of different designs. So if you could file a utility patent that protects the concept, then you'd be a lot better off. Yeah, exactly. And so the utility patent covers uh, you know, the adhesion of a wood veneer to a substrate for the purpose of a band. Mm-hmm. And so if another watch company wants to produce a wood band like us, you know, they would be in violation of our utility patent. But more importantly, it's an opportunity for me to license that wooden band And potentially, even though the brand name is analog, there's a potential opportunity for us to go ahead and produce wood bands for the smart gadget category, smart watches. And that's really great. Before we talk a little bit about the licensing approach, I do want to point out that you were very clever in focusing on the band because that is at least part of the key to your success. So if you can find some angle where you can protect that but then protect the line generically – then that's a really good strategy. So did you come up with that yourself? Yeah, I mean, I've always been really self-focused and self-driven. And, you know, when it became clear to me that nobody else had done it, I, you know, I began immediately researching what to do. I think that that is an incredible concept. So like one of the cutting edge highest technologies, an Apple Watch, was something from nature that's kind of a little old fashioned in a way, a wooden band for it. That's just really interesting. I think it's a juxtaposition that people will appreciate. The longer smartwatches are out, the more ubiquitous they're going to look and they're going to sort of no longer have the same sort of techie aesthetic. And I think there's a position, you know, a, a placeholder for us to go ahead and be producing those items. We're going to be launching the bands ourselves in a few months, but. You know, from a business perspective, it just has to do with an additional uh, opportunity to have B2B revenue, whether it be licensing, producing product for another company, um, you know, potentially an acquisition. I mean, it's it's there's a lot of value in owning that actual utility patent. So one of the interesting things that you told us was that you only have one full time employee right now. That's correct. And so your entire company is really you and one other person. And you're in all these fantastic museums. You have all of these fantastic products. How did you manage to do all of that yourself? I mean, most companies with your reach would have much larger staffs. So I think it's about properly delegating and bringing on subcontractors at the right time. You know, I've had quality control inspectors. I've got my suppliers. And we work with suppliers in Japan, Switzerland, China, the United States. They're kind of handling that. 
and having logistics organized. It's kind of about delegating this stuff properly and then bringing in house the things that we're really good at. The things that we were really good at, the sales, uh, the marketing end. I mean, effectively, we are a PR firm. We use the same software all the big firms use. We know how to pitch. We've got 350 coverages, including like national media outlets. So basically looking at the main drivers of the business and bringing them in house. Anything else that I can delegate or subcontract, I delegate and subcontract. So if we're doing a catalog, we need to hire a photographer. We'll go ahead and do that. If I need quality control done, I hire a quality control specialist. Um, if I'm running Facebook ads and we're not doing it internally, you know, I, I've definitely brought people on throughout the years, but ultimately it's, it's effectively a lifestyle company where we've been able to manage what we want to in-house and keep the stress level pretty low and, and mostly at bay. So one other thing I found very impressive is that you've joined this with your love of the earth and nature by giving back. I think that in the beginning, the the concept was to use natural materials. And, and ultimately, if we're going to use those materials, it only makes sense to put back. So with our wood line, if you buy a wood watch, we plant a tree. If you buy one of our cork watches, we plant an oak cork tree. Um, if you buy a number of our other products, so if it's one of our floral products, a portion of the sale goes to Bartram's Gardens, which is the oldest botanical garden in the country, and it supports their environmental education initiatives. If you buy a pair of our sunglasses, um, a portion of that sale goes to the Guide Dog Foundation to help train seeing eye dogs. It just makes sense. It, it allows me to go to sleep at night, um, and it just seems like the right thing to do. And, you know, obviously, it's good marketing. It's that extra feel-good moment. It's not the first thing that makes people buy from us or the second, but it's the kind of third or fourth one down that really sort of helps cinch the sale. And, and it, it adds that feel-good component that people people really want these days. And so at the end of the day, what do you think is the major driver that makes consumers want to purchase your watches? Um, I think it's the aesthetic. I think how different the actual aesthetic is. And then if if we can get somebody further in the funnel and they, they kind of understand the narrative about how we're a boutique independent design studio, then I think that really sort of clinches the deal because it's just a different experience. It's a different overall experience. And you get a lot more transparency as well. In what way? Well, for example, right, all of our Kickstarter backers, I think we've got 2,500 over five years. I mean, they see like the nitty gritty behind the scenes. They see this, you know, stuff off the production line. You know, our content that we produce as well is, is like pretty interesting. You know, we cover other artists. We used to cover manufacturing tied to Philadelphia, the city that we're in. I just think that there's a level of honesty that comes with having an independent company like this. That's really great. Getting back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier in that you're sort of a two person company. How does it work economically to be hiring contractors for all of the different pieces of this? So one of the rationale for having an in-house staff is that they're less expensive and contractors are, are more expensive. So have you ever found it a challenge to sort of meet your manufacturing cost targets by using contractors? And do you ever feel uncomfortable about outsourcing core functions to third parties? The reality is that the core functions can all be done in-house between me and, and Andy, who's the other person who works with me. I mean, I work 70 hours a week, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the reality is, is I know how I want things done. I know what works. Um, there's a lot of experimentation. And because, because I have so much skin in the game, you know, it's all about mitigating risk. But ultimately, I mean, there's so many tools out there that, that allow you to really create this sort of automated business. I mean, I work 70 hours a week because I want to. I don't have to. You know, um, and a lot of that is spending time focusing on, you know, new business endeavors, whether it be growing our B2B side or experimenting with a new sort of genre for a trade show, a new category. And, you know, for me in the beginning, it was I wanted to pay myself. I wanted to make sure I made money. The first year, I didn't really pay myself much. The next year, I made more money than I ever thought I would make. And every year after, it's continued to grow, and I've been able to keep a really lean, mean operation. My margins are really incredible because there's no middle people between me and my suppliers, and I've worked with the same suppliers for five years. I've spent a lot of time mitigating that risk by going overseas. I mean, I've been to China probably 12 times in four and a half, five years. I've been to my suppliers in the States like, you know, dozens of times. It's always been really critical to that face to face sort of meeting, and I think everything is negotiable. So I get really great prices. Um, it allows me to afford making mistakes at a small company, which I do. Um, but then it also allows me to reinvest in myself and in the company itself. We've had more than two people. It just didn't yield the results that I thought it would. Hmm. So, uh, you know, now that we've settled back to two, it's comfortable and there's a little bit less stress on my shoulders. And, you know, a lot of stuff is just automated. Everything, social media is automated. Our content creation is automated. Our mass email marketing is scheduled and automated. And so e-commerce is a really great space to be in. And, and that's really where we, we really shine. You know, we're a direct-to-consumer e-commerce website. 
So welcome to the new business model, America. This is great. It's wonderful for so many of our listeners to hear this story because it means you don't have to have a big staff. You don't have to have big overhead. You don't have to necessarily be making big investments to have a business that is a good business is a, and is an exciting business. So Yeah, I think Lorenzo brought up a good point too. People talk about having their products made all over the world in different countries, different places, and they think some people think they can just send it off and have it done, but I think you really need to go visit those places. You need to be involved, heavily involved with that for the things to really stand up to your quality standards. Lorenzo, you have a special offer for our listeners this evening. It is holiday season and the gift-giving time, and so listeners can get a special discount, and why don't you tell them how to do that? Yeah, so if you have somebody in your life who you think would appreciate a timepiece, which is an heirloom item, go to analogwatchco.com, and you can get 20% off with the discount code passage to profit That's on all our sunglasses, jewelry and accessories, and watches. Watches make a great gift, and they're an heirloom item that they're sure to love. And it takes three to four days, maybe a week, depending on where you are, to get the watch after you order it. Absolutely. And then if it's closer to the holidays, we will be expediting shipments. Well, that's fantastic. So we'll be right back with our pitch contestants and more from Lorenzo Buffa. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. WOR 710, the voice of New York. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. World. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest this evening, Lorenza Buffa. Now we're ready for our first pitch. Our first pitch is by Rachel Bagnola, and she is going to talk about Kova Helmet. My name is Rachel, and I'm here to talk to you guys about the Kova Folding Helmet. It's a folding bicycle helmet. You can also use it for skateboarding, scootering, rollerblading, roller skating. So to describe to you guys that can't see it, there's a fabric cover that actually zips on and off of the hard shell that's inside of it. And inside of that hard shell is a safety foam and a patented, which we can talk about later, technology that is impact absorbent. And so this fabric cover is removable so that you can interchange it and customize it to your look. It comes in different colors, different color combinations, and the chin straps are also removable and interchangeable because they also come in multiple colors so that you can customize this. It is a great holiday gift. It folds up to about a third of the size of a traditional helmet so you can easily put it inside of a purse, book bag, suitcase, and take it with you all over the world. And I created this in honor of a good friend who got into a bike crash when we were kids and she became permanently blind in one eye from the fall and the way she hit the back of her head. And being an avid cyclist since I was a little kid, um, cycling is very near and dear to my heart that I wanted to create something that would actually encourage people not only to be safe when they get outside, but also that they would actually just get outside more and bike. I always like to say, ride it out. Like if you're stressed out, Get on that bike, get on that scooter, and ride it out. They look extremely comfortable to me, like something you could actually make your kids wear. How do they feel on your head? They're very soft. There's a cushiony inside. There's a comfort layer that's on the interior that when you put it on your head, it has that moldable feel to it that it molds to the shape of your head. So if you have a big hairdo, like braids or just thick hair, this is actually one of the only helmets that 
I wanted to make that it actually fit all different types of hairstyles because I'm sure you've all seen people biking that have a helmet on, but it's not even like strapped onto their head or even like really put on their head. Now that's great. So this is a squishy helmet, right? So it's it's kind of soft, but it still gives great protection. Yes, there's a hard shell on the outside and the inside is soft. There's the fabric cover that's on the outside that is on top of the hard shell, and the hard shell is actually a bendable plastic. Um, So, Rachel, what sort of safety testing has this product gone through? It's gone through testing with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. That's the national certification for biking, skateboarding, and scootering helmets. And so we've gone through multiple rounds of independent lab testing that are certified to do that testing on our helmets where they basically drop the helmet on anvils at different angles and they heat it and freeze it and dunk it underwater and they do all these things to it to mimic real life conditions, environmental conditions. Oh, really? So people actually fall in cold lakes? Is that kind of what the freezing (laughs) test is for? (laughs) That would be pretty funny to watch. But um, no, actually, it's really the helmets are taken and they do all this testing on the sample. So we give them a ton of samples and they do all kinds of crazy stuff to it. We get to watch it, which is pretty cool. But if you're trying to sell a a safety device like a helmet, you have to have this testing, right? They won't won't certify it unless it's Right, correct. Completely 100,000% safe. Exactly, exactly, yes. As a product designer, this is what stands out the most to me because I know that you're dealing with a multi-year runway of design, iteration, testing. And, you know, ultimately when somebody launches a product to market three years later, that first version is is always going to be out there, but then there's going to be a new version and you continuously improve it. So I think there's a lot of tenacity that an entrepreneur has to have to sort of keep pushing it and trudging along and making sure you continue to make the stuff. And when you have a government agency that you have to abide by, and when your product itself needs to have that safety standard, I think that there's a certain challenge there that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs don't know how to overcome. It's an extra hurdle. It takes extra time and it's extra expense as well. So this is a little more flexible than regular bike helmets. Does that actually help when you fall? I mean, it seems to me like that little bit of flexibility might actually help protect somebody's head a little better it depends on how you're getting hit at the impact like where the source is and how you're hitting so really the foldability is sort of an extra part in addition to the impact absorption so the way that they look at it is when you get hit at a certain point how the energy disperses through it at that point so it really does depend but we more so make the assumption in the testing that when it's on your head it's holding its form and its shape and it solidifies actually as the impact goes through each layer it might seem like the flexibility does help but that's more so a function of just making it a more easy to collapse product is it just like a regular helmet then when you're wearing it on the outside like does it react exactly the same way as the bike helmet you can buy now? It reacts in a different way in that the technology that's being used that you see in like military helmets, hockey helmets, all types of safety gear, we applied it to a bike helmet, this technology, and I combine that with making a proprietary blend of this plastic. So to make the plastic bendable as well as making it impact absorbent, it was a combination of that plus the military grade foam that goes inside of it. When the impact goes through it, you know, with regular helmets, it actually cracks when Mm. you go through Mm -hmm. to, you know, go Mm -hmm. through a crash. Mm. So with our helmet, it doesn't actually crack at that moment of impact. It, It actually absorbs the shock and disperses it throughout the entire inside of the shell where the foam is. And that is something that you haven't really seen in bike helmets before. So it's a different approach, but it still works. You know, what I like about it is I'm an urban cyclist. You know, I have a car and I walk to work every day, but I pretty much cycle around the city because it gets me there faster. You know, the main issue and I think the barrier for people with helmets is like, what am I going to do with it? If I don't have a backpack, what am I going to do with it? And then also if you're biking in the summer and stuff, like it can get pretty gross and nasty. And this appears to be pretty lightweight, pretty svelte, compact and easily washable. Sounds like a great product to me. I used to bike a lot. I don't bike now, but but I, my kids were biking, and the hardest part was to get them to wear the helmet because it hurt. It's very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm assuming with all this padding that this feels... Yes, it's much more comfortable. It's very soft on your head, and everybody that puts it on, as soon as they put it on, they're like, wow, it's really comfortable. And people that have different hairstyles that have come up to me at biking conferences all over the country, they're like, wow, I can't find a helmet that actually fits me. So this is really opening up biking to people that maybe wouldn't have biked before. 
Do you have kids sizes in this? Yes, we do. Really, the smallest size fits teenagers. So we haven't made a size small enough for the little, little kids. But um, I've been able to fit a helmet on like a 10 year old even. It depends on the size of the head. So I, I tell people to base it on like, you know, some kids have big heads for those big brains um, that you have to have them measure measure the head to know, but it comes in multiple sizes. This is a really innovative, great product. How can people buy one of these? So if you go to mykova.com, that's M-Y-K-O-V-A.com, you can see a video of the product. You can see our whole store of all the different fabric covers and chin straps that you can select. And we're offering a promo code for coming on, being on this awesome show with everybody. So if you put in the promo code PASSAGE to PROFIT, you will receive a special discount. This is a great holiday gift that I think will help protect a lot of people on the road, but also get more people outside. I agree. Rachel Bignola, Cova Helmet. You're listening to Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart and PASSAGE to PROFIT on WOR 710. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. We're on to our second pitch right now. Presenting this evening will be Marcia Evans and Norm Lawrence with the Solus Edema Pillow. How you doing? My name is Norman Lawrence, and I'm here with my partner. Marcia Evans. And we've designed the Solus Edema Pillow, which is for people that suffer from fluid retention in the lower extremities. People have swelling in their legs for many, many reasons. That could be from pregnancy, from medications, from having surgery, heart disease, kidney disease. So we developed a pillow that stays on the bed because doctors tell you you need to keep your feet elevated. And when you put those two pillows on the bed... And in the morning, they're on the floor because you have tossed and turned and kicked them off the bed. So we designed a pillow that's going to stay on the bed throughout the night. It's a pillow that's essentially a wedge, but it's rounded and it has a cover. One is waterproof, the other is water resistant. And then it has a secondary cover, and that's the cover that's going to anchor the pillow to the bed so that you can't kick it off. And it's anchored to the bed because you're laying on it and you are anchoring it to the bed. It has a seven-foot runner that you lay on that's made out of a cotton material. So while you're laying on it, it is invisible to the body. So there's absolutely no discomfort. And if you try to use the pillows, other pillows that the doctors recommend, you already know they end up on the floor. You wake up in the morning with the same condition that you went to sleep with, swelling of the lower extremities. Or you can use this pillow for your upper respiratory issues. If you have breathing, gout, anything like that, uh, sleep apnea, or you just simply can't sleep flat on your back, this pillow will be there in the morning when you wake up and there's no other pillow like it in the world. That's great. What motivated the two of you to design and develop this product? This pillow was designed out of necessity. I was in necessity because I had diabetes. I died. How, I how can in, you be here if you died? <laughs> <laughs> I went into a cardiac arrest while riding my motorcycle to work. Uh-huh. And uh, I pulled over. And, you know, I dialed 911 like everybody else would do. And he answered, but uh, it was already too late. I fell off the back of the motorcycle. They said I was dead before I hit the ground. And the only reason why I'm talking to you now it's because there was an ambulance coming up the highway, and they hit me with the paddles and all that good stuff right there on the highway. It was an interesting day, I must say. So this is kind of off topic, but what was it like being dead? Do you remember anything? Uh, I got to tell you, when they say rest in peace, 
That's where it comes from. Dying is the most peaceful thing that will ever happen to you. Now, I have brown eyes, but when I woke up five days later, I had blue eyes. You know, there were so many things that happened to me that they cannot explain. You know, why did I wake up with blue eyes? And when I closed my eyes, I seen a landscape of beautiful landscapes that were changing colors. It was beautiful. So to me, dying was great. You That's know. So, so good to wow. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a really... I'll, I'll put it and, off for a while, but <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> hey, I'm, in, I'm in no rush to get back now. Don't get me wrong. You know, I love the colors. I didn't mind having the blue eyes here for a while. You know, but listen, I'm not ready to go yet. You know, I got to watch people enjoy this pillow, you know, and that's where, you know, there are just so many things that people say, oh, I want to do this. I want to invent this. But when it comes from necessity, you know that it, it works. I mean, you know, all the doctors, the cardiologists and everybody tells you, elevate your feet. The one thing that they never, ever tell you is how. So with the solace edema pillow, it's self-explanatory. You take it out the box and boop, there it is. You know, there's nothing else to do. And uh, it's a great pillow. And I know it works because I sleep with one every single night, you know. That's great. And it has so many different uses. That's true. You know, and every time I talk to another doctor, discuss it with a doctor, you know, they tell me, oh, you know, you can use it for this. You can use it for that. You know, I'm, they said gout. I, I didn't even know what gout was, you know. <laughs> so, you know, then they're like, oh, you can use that if you have sleep apnea. You know, or you got a bad back and you can't sleep straight. And the thing about it is, it's going to be there all night. We had one person testing it, and she said she tried to kick it off the bed because she liked to sleep flat, but she had swollen ankles. But she said she woke up in the morning, her ankles weren't swollen, so she adjusted to it. So I've got a few questions about the product. So also, I'm I'm an awful sleeper. I sleepwalk, I talk, I move in my sleep. Uh, and I use pillows for my back. I use this, like a few different types of pillows for my back. I've got like seven pillows in my bed. It's kind of ridiculous, but it's because I move around and I need to grab the next one to get it between my legs so I don't have a sore back in the morning. So first off is what did you guys do to develop this product and to bring it to where it's at now? Is it retail ready? What more can you tell us about the physical product? The pillow itself is made out of a nice dense foam, so it's never going to lose its shape. The initial covering, we have two of them. One is water resistant and one is waterproof. It's machine washable. You could the outer cover, just you take it off, throw it in the washing machine, and it's good to go. You just pop it back on. And where can you get one? You can order it from our website, which is edemapillow.com. E D E M A P I L L O W dot com. And so what is your market for this? I are you marketing mostly to consumers or to hospitals well, or assisted living or well, we have an order, our first order from a facility, which is a rehab, inpatient rehab facility down Congratulations. in South Jersey. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, you can get edema from anything and people of multiple ages, mostly the elderly, um, but anybody of any age can have it. I mean, if you have a surgery at 35, you might need it. You don't have to be elderly for that. Football players, when they have ankle injuries and they have to elevate you know, dance studios, you know, that's a common place. But uh, right now we're trying to get into the hospitals and nursing homes, any facilities, and we're also trying to just get into everyone else's home that needs it. There are so many people out there that have edema and don't know how to fight it. Right. Yeah. You know, the majority of the doctors, always, they want to answer it with water pills. You know, so this could possibly... Not for everyone, but for me, it did eliminate the water pill. So I no longer take water pills. With the proper elevation, it may help others the same way. So how heavy is this? Like, could I physically put it on my bed? Absolutely. It's about seven pounds. Oh. Yeah. I walked around New York with it today. <laughs> <laughs> Were you planning to take a nap somewhere? <laughs> well, we actually brought it just in case, you know, that you, you can feel it, you can touch it. You know, you can see that it, it is extremely comfortable. And, you know, the whole idea of it, you know, I mean, it's so simple but yet complex that no one else has ever thought of this. You know, when you see it, you're like, oh, my God, why didn't I think of that? You know, and the, the other part about it is that it actually does 
what it's supposed to do. Marcia Evans and Norm Lawrence with the Solus Edema Pillow. Thank you so much. Tell us again how they can find you and order one of these fantastic pillows. Again, that's edemapillow.com, E-D-E-M-A-P-I-L-L-O-W.com. Thank Thank you for having us. Oh, it is our total pleasure. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. The Voice of New York will be back right after this. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A w.com this ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson passage to profit continues with richard and elizabeth gearhart we've come to our third and final pitch this is a very interesting one it's a socialpreneur type of pitch i'm very excited to hear it we have swain fuller and joey hom with international youth fellowship my name is joey hom the pr director of the iyf And uh, right now, we are uh, looking at the Christmas cantata that is going to take place at the United Palace Theater uh, on January the 5th. And basically, the whole Christmas cantata is to bring the highest quality show, a world-class show, to those who are not uh, able to afford it. You know, those who especially uh, are broken up. I mean, when we go and visit families um, to work with their youth, uh, because, you know, IYF, um, we often find young people who are unable to sit at a family dinner because everybody's so broken up by work schedules, you know, whatever, uh, you know, things that they have to do. And also, you know, some families are faced with tragedies, especially if they're going through financial hardships and can't find any break in any part of their lives. So when the Christmas cantata comes around, everybody can just kind of take a load off and enjoy uh, a family experience together with everyone at a very, very low cost. I love that this is very low cost or even free for some people, right? You ask for a donation. And so your sponsors are really sponsoring this. And it's just a wonderful thing. You have three different acts, did you say? Yes. uh, The show is organized with three different acts. The first is the opera section where uh, we're talking about the very first Christmas. And also the second act is the musical. It's the uh, more modern day Christmas that we're more uh, accustomed to. It's the, uh, the gift of the Magi. And then we have the uh, the cantata message that really kind of brings it all together as to why we're doing this and how this is supposed to bring our communities closer and our families closer. And also to wrap it all up, we have a final uh, choir and orchestra stage where we're singing all of the uh, Christmas carols that we are most accustomed to hearing, uh, but in a live performance with a live orchestra. Wow, that's uh, fantastic. And so what is a cantata? Uh, yes, a cantata is a... Uh, uh, term that they use to explain a performance where there is singing and story associated with it. And uh, each of these acts all have a story. <laughs> I won't go too much into detail into spoiling everything. So I guess <laughs> yeah, you have spoiler to alert. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's a volunteer that works on this. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, each of these music performers and the uh, singers and, you know, orchestra performers, is, and including also the stage hands and also the workers, they are all uh, volunteers that come together. Uh, most of them are uh, South Koreans, and but they were all trained in uh, St. Petersburg uh, Conservatory of Music in Germany um, and all of these prestigious uh, places. Yet they have all come together to uh, put a show on together for uh, you know for free, um, especially during their September to October uh, tour. They have toured throughout America in 25 different cities and put on free performances in 25 different cities. And also uh, I, uh, the New York performance is kind of like the, uh, the last one that they put on uh, closest to Christmas. They do it because they love to see families come together and to have a great time together because you know, a lot of us, you know, have hardships in our hearts, but we never get a chance to really open up and talk to each other about it. And this show kind of helps people open their hearts up to 
each other and to the communities and to see that there is, you know, people who are willing to help, you know. The first act, uh, the opera, uh, is kind of like the uh, the ver- first Christmas. Uh, so it has inclusive, uh, it, it is inclusive of the nativity scene and also kind of like the, uh, the background uh, as to how that whole kind of played out. So um, spoiler alert, uh, this is kind of uh, reminiscent of... Uh, the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones, but not that graphic detail, but just kind of <laughs> the build up into as to how the first Christmas isn't exactly what we thought it was, you know, um, and the, the historical background of it. And then the second act uh, kind of focuses in on the family. We especially focus on the part where uh, there is a um, uh, uh, Anna and Chris uh, in a family, uh, a family of Jim and Bella. And uh, the father, Father Jim, is always busy, and he never has time to spend with his family, which is kind of reminiscent of our current American culture. We never have a chance to even sit at dinner together because we're so busy. And um, in the story, the it's it's Christmas, and uh, the kids would like to spend their time with their father, Jim, but um, he is unable to make it, and he keeps on pushing them back and pushing them back. And you know, eventually, as the story takes off, you know, we'll get to see what happens, and uh, we do deliver the message of of family together. Hello, this is Swain Fuller. I'm the youth president at the IOF Manhattan Center. And um, IOF is the nonprofit that works with the Grasses Choir to put on the Christmas cantata. And we also do different events around the world. Um, For the Christmas cantata this year, we are fortunate to also be working with different schools and principals of the New York City Department of Education. So we'll be offering um, special seating for a lot of students in junior high schools and high schools. During the cantata, we have a separate set of volunteers that go to Mexico, to Monterey, Mexico, to teach English and to um, give them hope. So depending on the month and the season, we have different events that we do each year. Um, June and um, in July, we go to Haiti, Dominican Republic, Panama, First Nation, which is natives of Canada on the reservation. We go and help them and we we give them a, a message of hope. Oh, every August we have something called the World Camp where we have over 2,000 youth come together at our music school in Long Island. There's different activities from different sponsors. Before, we've had Toyota, Home Depot, and um, Starbucks um, sponsor from different local franchises. But right now, we're looking to reach the different corporate offices so we can get bigger sponsors to expand to different cities. When you auditioned with us, I think one thing that you said that really caught my attention that really made me want to have you on the show is that the whole idea behind your youth fellowship is to start with kids and to spread a positive message throughout the whole world of positive energy and loving each other and taking care of each other. And I think that's important in today's society. Definitely. Um, I actually met with the IOF from volunteers who were giving out flyers in the street um, back in 2013 in June. The, the first event I met was an event called, that we do call Culture. And um, right away, one of the directors, they said, you know, please join um, our IOF. And the one thing that I love is that right away, they told me that the main principle of IOF is to develop young leaders to lead as they get older and to go out and into business by leading with the heart and not with the mind because in the universities we are trained to think well to um, act accordingly but never is there an emphasis on the heart and to care and to love and to and to appreciate and to have conversation and open dialogue so one of our themes is open connect and change so what are some of the other ways besides the cantata and the performances that you reach young people. And I, I'm, I'm assuming that the International Youth Fellowship is not just about performances, but it's an ongoing program that reaches out to young people. So what are some of the other things that your organization does? So recently we have started our initiative with the schools where um, recently there was a legislation that was passed about starting uh, mental health literacy in schools and for students to get in on it. And so we thought that, hey, that's great because we're trying to foster youth leadership. And this is absolutely a great way to start because um, what the IYF focuses in on is all about the heart. And, um, of course, we can talk about our current circumstances, the things that bother us. However, when it comes to talking about the heart and opening up our hearts and really talking about uh, what it is that we feel and how uh, we want to handle it or uh, when we're talking to our parents, you know, we often have these one-word conversations. They're like, how are you doing? I'm good. And that's the end of the conversation, and you don't know where to go forward from that. A lot of us suffer from that, and yet we don't ever address it. We don't ever get a chance to sit down with our family and to talk about how we felt today, how someone has made me feel today. 
but we just kind of gloss over it and say everything was fine. So when we go to the schools, we talk about these kinds of things and talk about why it is important that we talk about these things and also how it is that we can overcome these things, how, we, how it is that we can address these things instead of just bottling it up and just acting like everything's normal because a lot of us like to do that, you know, including myself. You know, for a long time, I had a hard time talking with my parents because I just wanted to show and uphold this image that everything is fine and that everything will be fine. Don't talk to me anymore, you know, because we're so insecure as to opening up. And so the IYF helps in doing that by uh, we have, uh, you know, in, in our, at our local place, we have a language class where we're talking about learning, learning Japanese and Korean. And also we have a dance class where we're talking about how we have to learn how to move our bodies and eventually our hearts follow. And we learn about languages so that we can learn about in what context it is that other people are talking about. So when we see from a different language perspective, then we learn how to think from the other's, other's point of view. How can people get tickets for the cantata? Uh, yes, we have a website called the, uh, the christmascantata.us. And um, if you find that you have no time to make it yourself, then you can also make a donation, uh, $30 or more. And each $30 that you donate to the website uh, will go towards sponsoring another person to going and sitting at the seat, which should be open to everyone. And uh, we want to make the seats available, especially for the children in Bronx, uh, especially District 9. That's, that's the area that we're working with in the schools. And uh, we want to sponsor them and their families so that they can have a chance to uh, see the show as well. And to find the rest of your organization, if I tried doing this, you just Google International Youth Fellowship and it comes right up, right? Yes, um, and our website is IYF USA. We have a uh, Instagram page, IYF Manhattan, and uh, you can look us up on YouTube as well, and uh, you'll find us everywhere. Swain Fuller and Joey Hom with International Youth Fellowship. Thank you very much. That's a positive message for this holiday season. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So, if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. Well, we've come to the end of our presentations this evening, and they were all fantastic, weren't they? Yes, I'm glad we had such great people on our show. And remember, everyone, to go to the Passage to Profit page at GearheartLaw.com, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W, and vote for your favorite project. So to summarize, we had Rachel Bagnola with Cova Helmet, Marsha Evans and Norm Lawrence with Solace Edema Pillow, and Swain Fuller and Joey Ham with the Christmas Cantata. So now Google Passage to Profit and make your choice. Remember, you can only vote once, and you have until next Sunday at 8 p.m. to vote. This evening's pitch contestants will receive a Passage to Profit t-shirt, and the best overall vote-getter for the week will receive an amazing Amazon <laughs> gift card valued at $25. <laughs> so before we sign off, I'd like to say thanks to everyone who participated today. I just love hearing these pitches each week, and I never can pick a favorite. We feel like people that are pitching are showing us the future. I want to say thanks again to our guest, Lorenzo Buffa, who took us over the top in so many ways. Lorenzo, do you have any final words for our listeners this evening? If there's something you love, just keep fighting for it. I think that's a theme that came through all of our pitches tonight. And we'd like to thank our producer, Noah Fleischman, our media maven, Kenya Gibson, our engineer, Rob, and the whole iHeart team. And don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. You can start thinking about what your pitch will be. 
And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeart with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, The Voice of New York. 